What's going on, everybody? All my cannabis-loving friends and family. I'm looking the wrong way because I moved the camera. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 420 Resistance Live show number 28. Thank you for tuning in and toking up. Don't be shy. Like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell down below. Thank you for joining me and my amazing panel once again for another week and another amazing show. I'd like to start off tonight by giving a huge shout-out to our show sponsors, Palm Side Extracts, Grassroot Fabric Pots, North Genetics, and Photon Phantom Designs. Uh, much love to all of them for being part of the 420 Resistance family and showing us some love and support. If at any point you enjoy the show, please just do us all up here a huge favor by hitting that thumbs up, subscribing to everyone on the panel if you haven't already, turning on your notifications, and most importantly, by sharing the stream on your social media network and with your friends. If at any time you find yourself needing to get a hold of myself, any of the panel members, the show sponsors, there's always links to get in contact with everybody in the description after the, after the show. Also, don't forget to check the show description for special discount codes on cool stuff through our show sponsors, associates, as friends, and as well as the stream nerd show schedule, which will direct you to a great cannabis live show every day of the week. Also, don't forget we have Super Chat enabled for anybody who wants to show some love and support. This week's show will be about the who's, what's, when, where's, why's, and how's of harvesting your outdoor crop, as well as how to handle all of your post-harvest duties like drying, trimming, curing, and making concentrates and edibles. So let's get ready for another good show. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Tricky D. Starting off tonight's panel introductions is Dirt Man Dan. What's going on, Dirt? What's going on, Tricky G? What's going on, YouTube? What's up, panel? Um, Dirt Man Dan here. You're a favorite micro grower, and I know nothing about outdoor. I've never done an outdoor marijuana grow. I've done lots of outdoor gardening, so I do have a little bit of input as far as that goes, but give everybody a quick update here. Got some uh, Doctor Who packed up in the bong. Let you guys see how my space dust is doing. Space dust is looking good. Oh yeah, we're uh, we're about ready to flip over here. As you can see, the uh, the scrognut filled up pretty quickly, and uh, she's looking really good on this uh, this organic run. So so far so good, man. Much less veg time this round, too. Oh, yeah, much less. It's not as uh, neat and clean as I like it, but we'll see what happens. Ah, you'll be all right. All right, moving on over to Land and Air Genetics. What's going on, brother? Hey, buddy, what's going on? Not much. Man, running around, getting ready for uh, a bunch of big things, man. Doing a lot of stuff, getting ready to move. Uh, yeah. Just keeping up with everything and having a good time, man. I'm chilling out, smoking some weed, ready to just hang out and talk about some outdoor harvests. Right on. Right on. All right. We're well, moving on over to Skunk Beard himself. What's going on, Pedro? Well, I always got to search for that mute button. Just, <laughs> <you know? laughs> Seems like that Skunk Beard thing's kind of taking over, huh? Um, <laughs> I'm doing good, man. It's good to be back. Uh, it's been it's been a while. Been trying to take a break. Been working a lot. Been whatever. Been trying to get my mind back on on track, I guess. But uh, good to be back. Good to see the panel. What's going on? Uh, who the hell just? Oh, that was uh, Gaston. I haven't seen his new Randy's new new emblem in there. So what's going on, Shadow, Shadow Panda? What's going on, Land and Air Dirt? Randy, how the hell is everybody? I'm interested to kind of compare more than teach tonight. Uh, I'm trying to take a more of a, a, a seat in the talking and, and bringing up topics than I am a teaching mode. So I'd like to compare tonight. So it'll be interesting to see what everybody has to say. All right. Cheers. All right. Well, Randy just popped in. What's going on, Randy? Well, on, everybody. Just some new fleas here, just relaxing, kind of getting the flu. So. Got something for that and got a spliff, cannabis, the best medicine just here. Excited for the show. Sorry I wasn't here last show, everyone. My internet service was out. So, so I'm here now and bless up to everyone on the panel. Bless up to Tricky D, the man of the hour. Bless up to Shadow Panda, Pedro Aguan. Dan, Dan here, genetics, you know what it is. Dirt Man Dan, you know I love you. No one shows you love but me. Bless up to everyone in chat, and glad that you made it to the show. That's right. Randy at least loves number two. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right, we're moving on on to Shadow Panda. What's going on, buddy? 
No, boss, we're just making a bunch of big moves here, trying to get a lot of uh, supplier deals going on with some seeds going, trying to get some fermented plant juice and other F products ready for convenience for some people that want it. And garden-wise, everything just laying and slaying with frost right now. That space that's going absolutely incredible. It looks like a disco ball right now. Uh, Baby Panda is just doing her thing, getting bigger by the minute. She's <laughs> insanely big. And I remember when I could just hold her in my hand, she take up half my forearm. Now hold her in my hand and she's up to my shoulder already. And she's just going insanely quick, man. And I'm just living for the experience, you know, positive vibes, trying to keep my head high, just trying to work and do what I can to support that baby. Right on. All right. Well, there's your introductions, everybody. I believe Dirt Man Dan had a question he wanted to ask everybody in chat, so I'll let him handle that. Oh, you know how, how I like to do. What's everybody smoking on, guys? Come on. Let me know. Let me see. What's new? What's interesting? What's good out there? Packing up a fresh bowl of some dark plasma over here. I've got the freshest of fresh uh, critical kush. Speaking of outdoor harvest, this just came down shit five six days ago probably shouldn't have pressed it out this early but you get itchy sometimes cheers i'm yeah, smoking I'm on some pure oxygen man uh, well not pure oxygen but like you know this air this beautiful air i'm just <sighs> breathing in boss nice. I got yeah, I'm, getting, I'm getting itchy too go ahead man my bad that's all good I got a half ghost, half cookies going. Nice. That's mm. good. That dark plasma tastes yummy. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I'm getting that itch too, Pedro. I'm ready, ready to start putting that press to work back here behind me. <coughs> What's going on, crazy Pedro? You're already close trimming, man. Stick some in a bag or just stick some between some parchment and see what happens. Yeah, I, I might try it a little bit. You know, I really like pressing my bubble, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's best to wait. It's hard to wait. It's best to wait. Uh, Urban Farmer, that, start, that doesn't start for an hour, right? We were actually talking before the show. I'm just going to go ahead and tell everybody. We were actually talking before the show. We know uh, everybody, Medgar One's doing a huge giveaway on his channel tonight. And, uh, you know, he's not trying to step on our toes or anything, but it starts halfway into the show. And, uh, you know, we're thinking we might just run a half show tonight, possibly, and uh, just send everybody over to Mega or One when he starts his giveaway. And we may even hop over there and jump on the live stream as well because, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to compete with that really tonight. And uh, it's just one night, and he needs to get it done. So Yeah, Med's got, Med's got kids and stuff, and for him to get on live is really tough anymore. So Yeah, this is like his only slot, and he's been trying to do it for a while. So we might just shut down halfway through and send everybody over to Mega or One's tonight. Give everybody a chance to win some cool ass shit. That's the way it sounds. Yeah, I'm not. I can't remember what he else he said he was giving away, but he was giving away like big amounts of things. Like he said, like all, if you all win, I remember. If you win nutrients, you're not getting like a little bottle. You're getting like a gallon. I remember yeah, something like said, that being said. He said lights, gallon bottles of nutrients, and and I guess I'll drop it out there just because I don't think they'll mind. I think there's going to be some special guests randomly appearing who might be dropping random stuff to give away that they are personally tied to. Oh, so, shit. Yeah. So there you go. Th let your mind go with that. Yeah. So there you go, guys. It's going to be it's going to be a big giveaway over there. Yeah. Fada might go ahead and drop the link. That's fine. So he should be starting in like 45 minutes. So, you know, we'll probably just shut down and go and go over there and hang out with him and have some fun over there tonight. I see Jay just jumped in. What's going on, Jay? Oh, not much. Just uh, getting in, kind of relaxing for once. Got a got an even clear, so I was able to join in. Wanted to say what's up to everybody. How's everybody doing? Right on. Doing good, brother. Oh, Dago says Grow Mouse is going to be giving some shit out. Growers' Choice lights. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be slamming it. And the fact that everybody in chat knows what he's giving away already knows that you guys want to go there. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> So that's totally fine. We'll just, well, you know, we'll have a smoke little chill session. We'll talk about harvesting some outdoor, and then, uh, you know, we'll go kick it over there. So, yeah, get into it. Drive us, lead us. Where are we at? 
All right. Oh, I got people in chat asking about my friend. This is a friend from back home. It's my homeboy, Nick. He came up to just hang out for a weekend, have a little vacation. Seven. So one of the good homies from back home, decade friend. Everybody loves these special guests that come in. My sister came in one time, and I had to, like, hand over the mic and headset and just step back. People love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know my sister right there, yeah. Um, all right, so where do we start this off then? We got about 45 minutes to talk about trimming outdoor. Where do we where do we start this off? I'm gonna lean on landing air for this one. Where well, do we start this off? About outdoor, why don't you start where you start? Like when would you put your seeds in the ground or when would you take your you know plants from indoors to outdoors? Well, we're just talking about harvesting tonight. We're just talking about when to harvest. Yeah. Okay. We're late, um, a little late in the season to be talking about planting. <laughs> I just figured we could recap. It would be nice to recap. No, we're in Croctober. Uh, yeah, no, it's Croctober. I'm sorry. So I guess I'll, that's something that a lot of happening. people, a lot of people argue about when to harvest. There's a broad spectrum of opinions about when certain things are done, and uh, it's also you know you've got to understand that things at different longitudes are going to finish at different times and also different genetics based on where they're grown at which longitudes and latitudes uh, just depending on where like mountainous regions as opposed to valleys depending on where you are um, yeah I don't know so I, I, got uh, a, I got a question to start you off with land and air actually specifically for you or to start off with you something that I've been noticing and trying to research a little bit on lately when you speak of, of, of when a plant is finishing, um, a lot of people look for that fade. How important is the fade compared to trichrome production or what do you look for in a finished plant? Well, I mean, a plant doesn't necessarily fade. It just depends on how you're growing it. Um, it you want it to fade, don't get me wrong. It's a, you know, a good sign that the, the plant's done with all of the nutrients and it's completely eating itself. Um, you know, and it's coming to an end, but you know, some people make soil really, really hot, kind of over tea, feed really long. And although they just feed water at the end, there's so much rich nutrient soil around that, you know, they end up with green plants at the end as well. Um, is that a bad thing? Uh, what's that? Is that a bad thing? Uh, I don't think necessarily it's a bad thing, especially if you're organic. I mean, obviously, if you're growing like in a cocoa garden or something like that where you're feeding synthetics outside, you definitely, definitely don't want that. Uh, <laughs> you do want your plants, to, uh, you know, you have control over that um, and you have the ability to literally leach the medium um, in a garden like that and kind of like a, a soilless garden scenario where you're either in straight peat feeding chems or, you know, cocoa feeding chems or whatever. Um, rock wool even, I mean, very few people do rock wool outside, but I've seen it and, uh, yeah, you definitely want to flush correctly at that point. Um, and, and then you will see the fade, you know, as the temperatures drop at night, it'll definitely add to the color. Um, your keratins and your and so if the, oh oh where is Nuevo Pope? No, never mind, never mind. Go ahead. It, so if the fade's not the the key thing to look for, what is the key thing to look for in a finished outdoor plant? I think it's a full picture, man. I think it's the development of the calyxes. I think it's the receding of the pistols. I think it's the. Uh, the development of the trichomes and you know what what stage of degradation they're in and maturity that they're in um it's a really big broad full picture and you also have to really like keep in mind that you know in a true outdoor environment a lot of your you know sometimes if it gets really really hot or it, the wind blows extremely hard for a long period of time uh, you're going to get false flags where you might see some trichomes degraded or ambered out on a certain part of the plant or the pistils have receded early. Um, and it might, you know, kind of trick you into thinking, oh, well, or, you know, even feeding. I mean, there are so many things that can cause the plant to, you know, show stress responses. And some people mistake that for, uh, for a plant that's finishing. 
and they'll pull it, you know, two weeks early where they really could have got a solid, you know, man, who knows the yield? I mean, different strains, you know, but you, you really want to keep it going for as long as possible is what I'm trying to say. I'm sure there's a little bit of preference involved as well, especially when it comes to trichrome production or trichrome. I mean, that's color. the thing though, is you don't have a preference until you've grown that strain at least a few seasons because every year is different. And it's not even close to outdoors. You have no control of the environment. So you're even if you do the exact same thing each sure. year, you're going to have a different result. Yeah, I'm seeing that for sure this year with the difference in the weather. So you're right on. So, so okay, so, yeah. so plant is done uh, in whose ever mind, I guess. It's done. Step one is... I strip the plants personally. My personal, uh, the way that I do it, is while the plant is still erect, I completely take every single fan leaf off of the plant. Um, 100%. Top to bottom, I trim them all the way to the base of the stem. I don't leave any crow's feet or anything. Damn. I really take my time. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Be thorough, top to bottom. And uh, yeah, are, that's my first step. Are you, are you chopping off the end of the, the fan leaves that maybe have half you know, half of their leaf is full of trichromes and the rest of it isn't. Are you doing that at that point in time as well? Or are you just getting rid of everything that has no trichromes? Uh, yeah, anything that's basically just, that's obviously just a big water leaf, a fan leaf. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll totally get rid of that. If there are some, you know, if I'm growing a Chernobyl crop or a crazy train or something like that outside where it's just resin rails to the very end, I'm probably going to be a lot more liberal because a lot of the times, even the petioles have trichomes all the way down. I don't want to get rid of them. So it really just depends on what it is and what technique I use. Uh, so, some of the cookies that I've seen are uh, people just harvest the plant completely whole and hang it because the whole plant is just covered <laughs> in resin. Sure. And you're, so, not doing a, yeah. you're not doing a wet trim right now, correct? You're not talking? No. Wet, okay. No wet trim. I'm not touching awesome. the calyxes or anything with trichomes on it at all. Yeah, that's, yep. that's my uh, technique as well. I just take off all the fan leaves because I don't want them curling up over my buds and then they're pain in the ass to get off later on. Um, and then I just hang up hang up the uh, strip down plants to dry for a week. Well, hello there, Photon. <laughs> hey, buddy. What's going on? I just got back from the post office. Drop oh, fucking, shit, you know, on off lights, huh? Oh, my God. <laughs> 337 dollars at the post office just now. How many nice. lights? How many boards was that? I don't know. <laughs> <A lot. laughs> yeah. yeah, I see the website's all sold out again, except for the sun boards. <laughs> Too many to count. Yeah, How about that? Well, shit. All right. Well, let's talk about uh, about ambers and cloudiness. You know, I like to pull it like 15, 20% amber and, you know, the rest cloudy. What's everybody else? You know, that's pretty much a preference thing. But whatever, what's everybody else's preference? It depends on if I'm doing sativa or indigo. And most sativas I like to shoot in the 15, 20% range. Most indigos I like to shoot in 25, 30% range, just roughly. I like more amber in my uh, indigos because it'll help that couch lock and everything. And I don't want that couch lock as much in my sativa. So... I know it's, I've got different preference depending on the ratio of the plant. Everybody's always going to giggle. Go ahead, Tricky. Oh, I love it. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's it's a mix of sativa and stevia. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a low fat sativa for the uh, stoner on the go. <laughs> it's, a low fat sativa. it's an alternative sweetener choice for cannabis. Hey, hey, pandas are Chinese, and I'm over here in America. I'm still learning things. Okay. Per cup of tea and you're all right. So I just can't so, say things right out. Oh, can, you, man. can you get stevia <laughs> from bamboo? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can sure whatever. It's a cane, right? It's a cane. There you go. <laughs> so Cam's over here in between land and air's got got a plant standing with, with no leaves on it whatsoever. Just just leaves with trichromes. And yep. what's next? So it depends on what it is, what time frame you're looking at. If you uh, need to cut it down and get it processed 
and get it gone for any particular number of reasons, um, I'll generally cut it into one to two foot lengths um, and do the old clothes hanger method where I fill up hangers and just dump them onto a, a rack and line them up. Um, if I have the leisure, I will cut the plant whole at the very base of the stalk, no matter how big it is, and hang it whole and let it take its sweet time to dry. Um, you like to, like to leave a little bit of stalk on the plant? don't like to break it down into six-inch buds? Yeah, I mean, I'll literally just hang the whole plant upside down, even if it's like a 10-foot oh, sure. plant. Oh, really? The whole fucking thing? Yep. Damn, really? Upside down tree. I've seen it. Yep. I've seen it. <laughs> okay. Upside down tree. That's an interesting approach. I, I've, I've seen pictures of that on Instagram where they, you know they've got leans and sheds where, and I and I thought, well, that's just a kind of a lazy way to approach to do it. But that's there's no problem with that. No, the reason I do that is because there's so much moisture in that stalk, and it takes so long for it to respirate out through the buds over time that it really kind of slow cures the plant to where when it's crispy and like actually done and like. I mean, anywhere from 14 to 17 days, even longer, okay. depending okay. on how big the plant is. I mean, sometimes three weeks. Uh, it's perfect. I mean, you could put it in a jar for two hours, and it'll smell like it's been in there for two years. It's it's amazing. Quick I question. love the way that cures the terpenes. Quick question from chat. Why upside down? Personally, I like upside down because of the profile that it gives the, the buds when they're dry and the ease of the trimming. I used to do nets a long, long time ago and cut everything off, and I really find that my product just looks better and just looks kind of sexier when there are some some leaves that haven't been touched that yeah, are nicely nice curled nice upward and bud. your sides where the rails are are visible and they, it's just shining, you know, it's... That's what, that's what I like. So, so now, now you're in your drying room, which is a plethora of different places and in different places of the world. Um, I'm assuming you're not just going to hang it, walk away and forget it because there's different conditions the plant's going to go through depending on what material your shed or your room or whatever it is. So um, what I'm getting at is I'm assuming you're going to control humidity and temperature, correct? Absolutely. You know, that's going to be what you do is going to be directly based on where you are. Obviously, your conditions are going to dictate what you need to do. If you can control the environment perfectly, um, then, you know, there's an e you know, I'd, I'd give the easy recipe of 60 to 63 degrees at 50 percent humidity. Um, you know, that's that's my preference for drying. That's what I like. A nice little slow dry. A little higher humidity, maybe even 55%, depending. Uh, some good air circulation in the room, but not too much. And uh, yeah, generally seven to 10 days like that does really nicely. But uh, depends on where you are and what you're doing, you know. If you're in What's Florida what, outside. What humidity do you have, think we get into the danger zone? 70s, 80s? Well, Why don't we ask Randy? I'm sure Randy deals with danger zone humidity all the time. Yes. <laughs> like here, because of the constant shift in the climate, because when you have a rainy day that it becomes sunny all of a sudden, then hail starts to fall. So in the tropics, because of that unpredictable weather pattern, it's a case where you have to ensure that where you're harvesting or where you're storing your plants, it's conducive so that you, you don't grow molds, proper airflow. A lot of the um, old school farms that are out in the way bushes, because it's so far from actual houses or even civilization, they used to build high huts, open huts uh, with touch or whatever they, they need for roofing, airflow from natural air. And most of these huts were located in dry parishes, so the humidity was not that high. Now, we keep hearing that airflow is very important and everything, and we can all logically think about why airflow is important, but why is too much a bad thing or too little a bad thing? 
Well, if you over dry a part of the bud, um, it's going to compensate uh, by trying to pull moisture from other parts and it'll dry unevenly. And your uh, terpenes are really going to degrade. Not only that, but uh, the, the, the texture of the bud, um, depending on what it is and like what the structure is, um, it'll either get really crispy and dusty or it'll get like kind of like spongy and really like just unappealing, not like a nice uh, dry, but like sticky, you know, like you want it. It'll just be like crispy and nasty and it just dehydrates itself because that rate of exchange is, uh, it's completely changed when there's air blowing on it, just blasting the respiration out of it. You know, it's, it doesn't have time to sweat naturally. It's just being blown by air and just getting dried and you know it's not good well i think and there's a difference go, go ahead Pedro. i was just going to take a step back for a second and, and think what maybe some other people don't hear don't think about or maybe you know they do i don't know but when you talk about taking a plant and cutting it down and just hanging it up you're talking about a quite a bit of space Oh yeah, and I don't know that I don't know that a lot of people necessarily compensate or give themselves enough space. I know for damn sure I didn't the first year give myself enough space for drying and curing. Oh yeah, it's something that nobody thinks about until it's coming up, or they've had guidance and help. But uh, if you have a large garden, it has to either yeah, it has to have somewhere to go. So that's like one of the main things is you need to have a place for that to be processed. Um, and the drying is the most important part because you do need adequate airflow. You don't want to shove things into a tiny space. I mean, you can really fill a room up. Don't get me like, trust me, you can stack a room, um, head to toe, but you still need ample air movement. And if, I mean, it just depends on what your garden's like and how big your plants are, you know, yeah, you it's, it's can't let your humidity get too high if you're really stacking them in the room like that either. I mean, you can you can manage a drying space as well for a large garden by harvesting in certain sections, like taking down certain crops at different times and different strains and blocks so that they each dry in their own individual schedule. Um, I've seen a lot of people utilize small spaces like that where they'll you know, start taking down things at the end of September and they'll go all the way through November. You know, that's kind of like me. That space <laughs> just to be able to have that extra time. And the oh, things that they allow to go longer are the things that can go longer, you know, cough, lemon haze, uh, silver haze, things like that. I plan it out. I plan my space out. I plan my freezer space out. I plan out when I'm going to have more free space. Uh, it becomes quite a Quite an intricate puzzle schedule, if you will. For sure. All right. So now that we talk so much about the drying, everything, why don't we move on to the next important part of curing? Well, that is true. Yeah. Well, we've got to get to the curing point, right? We still have some leaves on this. We can't just cut them off and throw them into a bucket, right? Or can we? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it depends on what you want to do with that trim, in my opinion. Like, if it's going to edibles, uh, you don't need to cure it per se. I mean, you do, you there's not it's not going to hurt, but you could just leave it open and let it dry. Um, if you are trying to make hash, I would highly recommend treating it exactly like your flowers, um, the exact same way. You know, whether whatever receptacle of whatever. Uh, uh, Jesus, man, I'm stoned. Uh, whatever receptacle of whatever material you decide, whether it's glass, plastic, uh, the old turkey bag, whatever you're keeping your 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 product in, keep it, keep the trim in the same thing, and just have more. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm gonna carpenter you over there still. Yeah, I'm over here. <laughs> how's, your, how's your outdoor looking right now? You getting close to chopping or what? Yeah, I got a, I got about another about two weeks ish, two and a half weeks on some of them. Some will be down in the next like week and a half. You know, but yeah, it's, they're all doing really, really, really good. They've all starting to swell up. Like most of the sativas are starting to really thicken up and fatten up. Like that Sonic screwdriver and the Mickey Kush, 
And especially that nurse Jackie just exploded too in the Chernobyl. But yeah, it's looking really good. They're starting to uh, starting to do their final final. I'm I'm finishing up that. I'm getting close. So tell tomorrow and tell about round next couple of weeks. All they're getting is uh playing good uh, water and a little bit of uh, molasses here in between. Nice. So I'm excited. <laughs> Well, yeah, right on. Yeah, I got all mine down except for the one space dog. Nice, all right, nice. so where are we? Yeah, I got a big surgery coming up. Oh, sorry, buddy. Go for it. Oh, no, you're good. You're good. Oh, there is one more thing to harvest that in here, and uh, that's because not a lot of people do it, but uh, if you are KNF style, this is an awesome time to get a lot of plant material. Those fan leaves that Landon Air was talking about, they make awesome, awesome, awesome fermented plant juice. And you can definitely use those leaves and sugar uh, to make fermented plant juice and then use that in your next harvest as your nutrient base. Can I step back for about five minutes here real quick? Um, washing your plant. And, and don't let us not laugh at it yet. <laughs> but a, a lot of people have heard out there um, that you can make, make up a water solution, a water and an H2O2 solution and, and wash your buds um, for PM, for dust, for bugs, for a plethora of different reasons that they've come up with. Um, what's, what's the panel's thought on, on washing your buds uh, immediately after harvest prior to drying? Ooh. Uh, personally, my personal preference, I won't say that, yeah, uh, I'm not going to call it wrong, but it's definitely not something I would do personally. Um, I have personally thrown away 80% of a large outdoor crop due to powdery mildew. And that is literally exactly what I did. I burned it on a bonfire. I didn't try to save it. I didn't try to give it a baby bath. I, I burned it. So... I, so I would say it's part of farming, you know. Ew. <laughs> I don't. Know. I would say the yeah. only time that's justified is if you live like in the southwest and there's a big dust storm, and you're doing it to get dust off of your plants. I'd say it's justified. Then I've actually done it. Uh, I saw a thread on Reddit like three years back talking about it, and um, the way I've seen it done recently is like a bastardized version of that. Um, I see people do, they call it the three bucket method. Um, so they got two buckets with regular water in them and they got this one bucket with lemon juice and, uh, uh, baking soda in it. And that's the part that makes no sense to me because lemon juice is an acid and baking soda is a base. So they're just going to combine and make water. Um, so basically, you're, you, you've got, about that. you know, calcium bicarbonate, <laughs> so you've got, yeah, right? I mean, They're going to react so one the, another and cancel each other out. Well, it's, that's, let's not sidestep the fact that Photon's a fucking genius over here. So <laughs> the, the real way to do it and the actual, like, first way that I saw it done and the way that would actually work is if you, is three buckets. Um, you have one with lemon juice in it, one with, um, uh, baking soda in it, and then one that's just water. And you dip it in the one with the lemon juice, and that dissolves things that dissolve in acids in the baking soda, and that dissolves things that dissolves in um, alkaline or basic water. And then you dip it in the, the regular water to clean everything out. And that's the way it's supposed to be done, but somehow that got turned into put everything into one bucket and then have two clean water buckets. I don't know how the fuck that happened, but. <laughs> Oops. How about another yeah. question? Um, when it comes to harvest time, are you trying to get out there early morning or are you trying to wait until nighttime? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to wait until after that first light or, or, or what? It depends, bro. Are you legal or are you illegal? Are you creeping <laughs> or are you not creeping? Let's say at this point in time that we're all legal. If, so, if you're legal, then wake up and do it whenever the hell you want to. I like to not work in the heat of the day, and I'm a real early riser, so I'd probably get up at like three o'clock and start hacking at shit, you know. And no, I know that. that early probably in the morning. 
Sometimes what plants have dew on them, isn't it? I was always brought up and I was always taught you chop it at like as soon as you can before the first light comes on. They're, the buds are fatter, they're slower, the calyxes are bigger, the trichromes are bigger. They're just, they're in their, their fat natural defense mechanism and everything's bigger and more. Uh, I, I can't think of the fucking word right now, but that's what I've always been taught and that's what I always do. And it's basically kind lazy. of preference, I guess. I can't lazy. get out of bed, <laughs> so whenever I get up is when I would harvest. <laughs> yeah, I would. I actually, I actually agree with Carpenter on this. I don't know about as far as like I don't know the science of like swollen heads or whatever, but I do like to harvest before the lights come on. I feel like the, the plant comes out with a better finishing flavor profile and stuff when you harvest before it's in wake up mode. But uh, well, uh, I want to say regarding that. Regarding that, I do harvest um, f before first light. I look at it at the biological um, sense. The plant is asleep during that time before it hits first light. Once it hits light, it's awake. It's using up the energy. I like to chop it down before first light or anything, where all of that is stored in the plant. This plant is just storing it up and making that oxygen not burning away that carbon, um, the carbohydrates that makes the THC. Fatter and more trichomes are produced because the plant has been stirring that up while it's asleep. It doesn't need to work. It's awake, all of that is being used, so some of the trichome production is not as much. But for me, first light, that's a preference for me. Thank you very much for explaining it like that because that's basically what I was thinking. I just couldn't say it. <laughs> I actually follow my mom, dude. Uh, my mom used to teach me that uh, most of your trichome production is going to take place at night because uh, when the lights come on, the plants can absorb nitrogen. And when the lights are off, they don't absorb nitrogen. So naturally, what they do when the lights come on is they're growing. And they're trying to produce uh, more bulk, more uh, uh, more plant. And uh, when the lights are off, they can't suck up that nitrogen. Nitrogen is used for primarily growth. So what they do is they focus on rosin production. And since she always told me that, I always like to get that final night of that rosin production in before I chop her down. And so when the lights come on, it doesn't stop that production. I'm trying to capture that production, much like KNF. How you want to go out early mon morning and catch that microbial production on the leaf. You want to catch that perfect rosin production time right at the end of its uh, production line. Pedro, wouldn't it be so what I do. sick if like a plant like just had like a stalk with slabs of rosin hanging off of it? Dude, I'm just thinking this thing for a long time, dude. We're you gonna could have go that up take somehow. A <laughs> I don't have to press it; just scrape it off. No, no, I just get it right off the tree. Read that up somehow. Just I'm glad you brought it. So, so, so here's my quick. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so here's here's my quick two cents on this whole thing. Um, I, I generally don't harvest all of the leaves off of the plant while it's standing. Um, most of mine comes from the size of my plants and the time that I personally, usually me and Dizzy sometimes, um, have to spend on the plant. So I don't, I don't cut all of the, the, the leaves off of the plant while it's standing. I do that right at harvest. And, I'm gonna, and I take it down into you know, long branches and hang that in my drying space. Um, where the hell was I going with this? Uh, oh, cutting. There's no logistical way that I can cut just before the lights come on or essentially the sun comes up in my, in my outdoor situation. I would have to have a, either a, a light deprivation, you know, place, or I would have to start when the sun went down harvesting to complete maybe when the sun came up. So it's not logically possible. Now I agree with everything everybody on the panel says when I'm in my indoor, you know, I'll even shut the lights off for sometimes 36 48 hours before I harvest. Um, a lot of the uh, chlorophyll production stops as well during that time. So there's a plethora of reasons to do that. When you're in an outdoor situation and you have a lot of big plants, sometimes it's just not logically possible. So I, I harvest when I can. Um, sometimes a, a harvest of a plant, depending on how many people 
are harvesting it with me. If it's just myself, it could take all F and day. It could take two days. If I've got five, six people here, you know, last year Tricky came down and helped take it down a couple of plants, which was freaking awesome having somebody with experience come down and help. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't take as long. So you, sometimes you can start right early in the morning and get everything done like that. But so it really depends on the situation that you're in. Uh, obviously the, the best situation is to take it down before the lights come on. Well, you know, touching on that Pedro real quick, I might be able to actually come help you because I'm almost done over here and you're just getting started. So yeah, I anyway. <laughs> get started. yeah just about cool. I've talked about that. All right. So where are we at? Landon there. What's your thoughts on the, uh, on the uh, harvesting before light or after light. I mean, I, I under, you know, I agree with everything as well, but like Pedro said, sometimes logistically you can't, you know, if you were to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and like work till 7.30, you know, you'd get nothing done. So that's why I said I start early and I work till like the heat of the day and then I stop and anything that isn't done, I'll just let go till the next day and then just restart and kind of do like really early starting eight, nine hour blocks. Do it like that. Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to harvest before light came up. And the problem I was having in the greenhouse is early in the morning here is it was, you know, 95% humidity inside the greenhouse early in the morning. I had dew on the plants and I, you know, I just don't feel comfortable harvesting when there's dew on them. So I was waiting for the sun to come out, yeah. dry the dew off of them, and then I was getting them down. Another excellent point. Yeah. Go ahead, Carpenter. What was you saying? Yeah. <clears throat> I, wake, I wake up at like 3 o'clock, and I have about like four or five of my buddies over here, and we each go take a plant. And then once, we, once it starts getting light out, we stop, and we do the next thing the next day. So, But, yeah, like Pedro was saying, if, you know, sometimes you can't do it, you got to do with what you can. You know, if you have a shit ton of people. You can do it if you're doing it with you or just when you, you know. Sometimes I do it when I can. You know, I wake up. It's like eight o'clock. It's like shit. All right. So it's all on what you can do. And kind, of off, kind of off topic, but no, I'm not really off topic. But speaking of outdoor harvest, have y'all been checking out Solo Farms Brown Guy 420 shit lately? My Yo, goodness, is it looking good over there, dude. I've been following that whole thing from the point in time that he's been uh building those greenhouses getting the property hell even when he was working for the last guy i've been following him and i have to say this year even though that he stepped through those videos and is kind of saying he got out there late and he wanted it and he did what he had to do i think he pulled off one of his best harvests that i've seen since he started streaming on youtube and it looks amazing out there i mean the amount of work that he put in and the care that he gave for them plants really shines through in the end result. And the fact that he does it all natural in a no-till style is just even more impressive. Here's my thing, too. Is I this was going to say the same year thing. In that spot? It's his first year in that spot. And he's got all the outdoor plants, the four greenhouses. Like To be able to go in on your first year and, and set that all up and smash it, Man, that's that's props for me on that. That's I've been following him for a long time as well, and I'm just kind of upset that I'm nowhere near any of the dispensaries that he's going to sell to. Yo, the thing that tripped me out was all the stuff that he had to do with those greenhouses to beat off that frost and everything just at the start of that season. If y'all watched the start of that season and how hard they were burning, he they were this point. burning stove in the greenhouses. Yeah, if you watch how hard he worked to get to this point, seriously, if he ever hears this at all, hats off to you, man. You put in a lot of work there. You put it out there and show what farming is really about. And you was out there dirty, grimy every single day showing us exactly how it's done. And that was a great way of showing people how it's done the right way. So let's pull us back on, on track here for the last 15 minutes. Uh, we're, we've got plants that have been hanging uh, for, you know, 10, 14 days, depending on, I guess, your situation. Um, from there, uh, are we just down to kind of trimming like our regular indoor harvest then? I mean, are we back to regular? It depends, man. Yeah. Um, it depends on how much you care. <laughs> it all comes down to you at this point. Uh, that's the difference. You, I mean, you could literally have the exact same uh, skill level of grower with the exact same quality crop and two different dries and cures and trims, and they will look and be completely different in the end. 
Um, and that's really like people can grow good weed, but it is a full picture of being really good at this. You've got to learn how to cure and properly manicure. And, you know, some people under trim, some people over trim, some people mash their buds with gross scissors that they don't clean. Some people go the machine route and run things through machines. Uh, the trim bag, you know, is really popular right now. I see a lot of people with outdoor harvests using the trim bag. Um, I personally have used the trim bag on some stuff. Uh, it works for certain things. It does not work for other things. That's what I've heard. Um, just depends on what it is, you know. But, is that uh, the one where you just stick the whole branch in and it just sucks all the leaves off? No, this no, is no. Egg, this is yeah. the one where you take all the, the buds dry off the stalk that are untrimmed. And you stick them in this uh, bag and you basically just shake it in a circular motion and it makes like a centripetal force um, to where the buds are spinning like in a washing machine. And uh, it uses friction to pull the leaves off basically. Um, and it, it does a decent job on certain things, things that are really chunky and dense and uh, aren't, don't have a lot of foxtailing or protruding calyxes. It does a decent job. Um, you're going to lose a lot, a lot, a lot of trichomes definitely doing that. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend it if you're really looking for some super quality. You know, always go back to the scissors for the highest level of quality. Dry trimming with scissors is, in my opinion, still going to make everything look the best. Yeah, I don't think anything's ever going to top a hand trim. I don't think they'll be able to do it. Yeah. I think I saw something on Instagram of this machine where they put the stock into the machine and then like uh, it pulls it through and it plucks all the outer branches off and then they just yeah. scoop it into a bin. It, so looks like a wood worth it? it literally looks like a wood chipper. I don't know if you guys have seen that thing, but it, it just looks <laughs> like you just take all the entire branch and you put it in there and it just sucks it through and just and strips all the leaves off. But the funny thing is, other than the bottom branches, I don't see much damage happening from that. And one dude tore down like, I don't know, like 10 or 15 plants within that little short segment. And it took him like no time at all. There was no individual bud half in the trip or nothing. He just dropped it into a bin. And I don't see any of the bottom buds getting damaged. It's not like a trimmer. It's just like a plucker, I guess. Like it plucks their branches for you. But yeah, man, it saves a little bit of time, I guess. I've used quite a bit of quite a bit of different kind of trimmers. Actually, I've used some tumbler trimmers, both the circular and the actual tumbler. And um, I don't I, anything that it, that involves a, me, a, a me, mechanized function is going to number one beat your trichromes, leaving you with less trichromes on your finished finished product. It's going to be uglier. And then you got to try to find that those trichromes that you then lost and fell off, you know, and, and if I guess if you're pressing rosin like I was last year, it, it comes in handy. But I, I, as far as I'm concerned, do not put your buds in a machine. That's, I will say no on that one. I know this is all talking and we're at the end of the show, but I did want to point out since we're talking about these different machines or such, I wanted to point out that really, really cool machine that Jinx Proof just got that count seeds. Dude, I can't stop watching those videos. I keep watching them back at work, and it's just like 800, 900. <laughs> and I'm just like, jeez. Now, here's my other thought, just to, just to cap that. There are places at, for these machines, and I guess that comes into the commercial industry when you're when you're growing thousands and thousands of plants. There's just no way to, to hand trim all that stuff. But that brings us into a whole other conversation that I don't agree with as well. So that's I, I would tend to disagree with that, man. I know some of the biggest operations in Colorado that put out the highest quality hire hand trimmers around the clock three eight hour shifts 30 to 50 people a at a time would you say that's the norm or out, the yeah, if you're pumping out 1600 pounds a month you're gonna need at least 50 people working around the clock on three shifts to get that done but you can also get 60 and eighth for it you're making you, a you're making a thirty two hundred dollar pound for tax. Would you, you say know. that in the commercial industry, the majority of the people hand trim or machine trim? Um, in the industry as a whole, on the legal level, I can't speak for any other state because I only really know about Colorado. Mm -hmm. But uh, in Colorado, I would tend to say yes. A lot of people use 
uh, rotator trimmers, uh, trim pros, um, twisters, the bonsai trimmer scissors. I've seen a lot of people use. So, uh, yeah, quite a few people like to do that because it takes like you know a fraction of the time, cuts down on labor, blah 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 blah. The people that are really doing it well, like uh, what's that? House of Dank, House of Dankness, uh, Rare Dankness, Scott's place. Um, they're they're all hand trimmed, and Good. that like quality it. is through the roof. It's in my opinion some of the best dispensary weed I've ever seen in Colorado. It is really good. Nice. Um, well, like you know, beautiful, pronounced yeah. calyxes, resin heads yeah. that are fucking mature. They look great. Now, Lamb, while we got you here, I want to ask you a really important question since I think you're the best one to answer it. And since it's a harvest show, but how do you exactly harvest when you're looking to harvest for seeds? Uh, you're looking at the seeds, man. It's really easy, actually. It's super, super easy. Uh, you pick a couple seeds, you pop them open, and if they're not ripe and done, then you don't harvest the plant. <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about the process in which it takes from once you know it, it's done, what are you doing? That quick process of the seeds, because I know it's a quick process. I'm just trying to get it out there because I know a few people is asking, but what's your process once you know them seeds are ready, what you doing? What am I doing to harvest my seeds? Um, I cut my plants down and I shuck my seeds wet out of the plant. Um, I basically manipulate the buds and break them apart with my fingers to all of the seeds uh, find that it's a lot easier and it doesn't uh, mess with my allergies as bad when I'm sorting through a bunch of dried weed to get seeds as opposed to doing it while it's wet. Um, so I pop everything out wet and then I let those seeds dry for a few weeks before I do anything with them. Um, just in open air in a cool place, generally dark. Um, and yeah, that's uh that's my little process. Um, I knew I've done it dry time. a lot, but it's it's I don't know. I don't like the separation. I don't like the the sieving, like the shucking. I mean, I know there's a bunch of tricks and stuff, but uh, the wet for me just works really easily. No, I really appreciate it and everything, because you know I'm no breeder or anything, and I don't ever plan on breeding. But it's nice knowledge to have, and I just never done. Like when my, when we bred up for our own personal stock, we would wait until it's dry and then just, you know, shake them all out and do that. But like I said, that was for personal stock, not professional breeder level or anything. I just wanted to get the mind of a breeder real quick. That's all. Cool, man. <laughs> all right. Um, we got five minutes left, guys, before we shut this down and, and head over to Medgar ones. So, you know. Whatever. we got five minutes left. We'll do a nice little smoke sesh before we run out of here. Uh, everybody, when you head over there, do me a favor and just say Tricky D sent you when you hop in chat, you know? Go I think, there and show some love. For, uh, you know, for outdoor and indoor, there's going to be a spot like we just kind of ran into where it kind of becomes the same as indoor, just as a different volume. But I, th I think we talked pretty good and covered really quickly, actually, and, and, and hit on a lot of really good topics, actually. Cheers to the panel yeah. for shooting out some good questions. Um, I think we covered a lot of the different aspects of, of outdoor from indoor as far, from a harvesting standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and maybe we'll touch on it again next week since we cut it short tonight. Mm -hmm. Just want to end with something quickly. The killing process does call for a lot because here in Jamaica, Good bud, you can as I said, you can grow good weed. How you cure it does matter because I've had weed that is still wet. Burn that shit. I don't burn it. I literally sit it down for a couple of days let it dry out because to burn it, you burn the living Jesus out of your throat. It's horrible. It's never again. Then you have it over cured where you're not actually tasting anything from it. That right cure yeah, that right, that right, right texture, I should say, is what you're aiming for, not too dry, not too wet. Also, uh, whatever leaves. For me, I cut off pre-cut, then when they're dry, I do a little trim up, make it bitter. I ain't gonna lie, when you, when you smoke some of that, it makes it bitter. So proper manicuring of your weed is a good etiquette for, regarding curing your weed. So just wanted to put it out there. 
Right on. Nice. All right. Anybody else got any closing things they want to get in there before we dip out? Um, no, thanks for a good show, man. That was fun. That was a quickie. Yeah, that's, that's kind of weird, ain't it? Just cutting one in half, it feels funny. Yeah, it does. It's it's odd. It like, doesn't seem long enough, but I guess it's good. And Med's going to have a really <laughs> nice giveaway, so that's cool. Yeah, we can come back and cover it next week from a, from a curing standpoint, and maybe uh, maybe we can turn yeah, it into a processing as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think we should do that next week. All That's right, well, nice. since, you know, oh, sorry, Pedro. No, it's up to you, but it'd be a good segue. Yeah, I think, I think we might do that next week. We'll start off, pick up where we left off tonight, and we'll just get into doing uh, curing and edibles and, and concentrates and all that good stuff next week. So, all right, guys, well, thank you for tuning in and soaking up. Don't be shy, like, and subscribe. Uh, everybody, head over to Med Grower One's channel, and, uh, you know, maybe you'll win some cool shit over there, show some love. I'm sure Fada and Robert will be posting the uh, link and chat again soon. Uh, and just head over there, tell them Tricky D sent you, you know, and we'll be we'll be over there in a minute. So we'll see you guys over there. Peace. Yep. Best up. <laughs>